Welcome inside another exciting edition of the Stingray Show, everybody. I am your host, Stephen Ray, and uh, we have a big show on tap for you as we ch count down to Championship Weekend, as we're going to be joined today by Dari Noka off the top of the show from ESPN. We're also going to be joined later on by DJ Shockley. So sit back, relax, and enjoy as Heath and myself get you ready and primed for a huge weekend of college football only on The Stingray Show. The dogs and Stingray are coming for you! <laughs> this is Stephen Ray, a.k.a. Stingray, coming to you live from Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Good afternoon, Mr. Feinbaum. Sting right here, and I'm about to shoot the ball with you like all the Auburn students do down at Auburn. Worst defense ever! So without further ado, here is the biggest. <laughs> Going for the field goal. The kick is up. It is away. It is no good. Chris Davis. Bringing it out of the end zone. Oh, he's got blockers. Chris Davis up the sideline. Here he goes. Here we go, guys. Dobbs back to pass. Launching the ball. Jimmy, he's got it. Jimmy, he's got it. Touchdown, Tennessee. They shot the dogs in Sanford Stadium. Are you kidding me? My God Almighty. What an epic way for the Tennessee Georgia rivalry to end this game. What a play! Wow! Welcome inside another edition of the Stingray Show. I am your host, Stephen Ray. And without further ado, let me just go ahead and bring up my co-host, Heath. Heath, how are you doing today, sir? Steven, it's fried bologna sandwich Friday, brother. Had me a fried bologna sandwich for lunch. I actually got to eat lunch before the show. That's an oddity, but I'm ready yes. to go. We got some big guests. I'm yes, ready to get going. We, yes, we do. Uh, as a matter of fact, right off the top of the show, we are about to bring on a guy who you've probably seen on the SEC Network. He hosts uh, the uh, SEC final show after college football late at night on the SEC Network. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the one, the only, Mr. Dory Noka. Dory, how are you doing today, sir? I'm good, guys. Stingray, that, I tell you what, man, that open, that's a strong open to your show right there now. That's, that'll, get, that'll get them fired up every week, like in every day, I'm sure. I mean, that's, that's strong stuff. Thank you, man. Uh, are, you, are you staying healthy with all of this COVID stuff going around? Man, we've been lucky. My my wife, my three kids, myself. I mean, we're 
you know, it gets hard, like, for all of us. I mean, we're playing it really safe. We're having the kids stay home all the time. No school in, per- in person. You know, it's it's the whole mental versus physical thing that everybody's got to try to balance out. To this point, we've been healthy, so hopefully the same for you guys. Yes. Well, uh, Are you, Do you have any crazy protocol coming into the station? I mean, is there, like, a lot of tests you got to pass to get in? No, you know, the, I mean, COVID? it's it, – no, to, to come in here – so, first of all, like, it's – you know, we went six months without ever stepping foot in here. Um, and then once football started, I think we started coming in like two weeks before the season. You know, they issue us all uh, masks. So all the Disney employees, Bristol, Charlotte, L.A., wherever, have the same masks. Um, you know, supposed to check your temperature before you come in, all that stuff. If you don't feel well, don't come in. We're shorter in, in terms of numbers. A lot of the people that do our graphics or our editors, they're all doing things from home now. So we have maybe half the number of people in here as we used to. Uh, you know, we wear our masks on the set until we're literally on the air. So we, we've got, we'll be sitting around the set, which they've created new sets to keep us socially distant. You know, we're about eight feet apart, uh, but we've got our masks on until literally until we come right on the air. So, you know, I mean, nothing crazy, nothing that, that we shouldn't be doing. I'm, you know, they, to this point, uh, the spread has been very, very minimal, if really at all. Well, let me just go on ahead and get your reaction uh, to the big news this past week, uh, the firing of Gus Malzahn. Were you surprised at all by the firing of Gus down at Auburn? Yeah, I mean, I I don't want to offend you here, Stingray, but <laughs> beating Mississippi State is not necessarily something right now that's going to save a man his job, Okay. It clearly did not save Gus his. You know, in this conference, as I have learned, and, I, and I'm not originally from this conference, okay, but I have learned being in this conference and around it long enough, when it comes to fans, impatience, boosters that will spend money to make things happen, nothing will surprise me. And I've heard too many times that they're not thrilled on the planes, that they're not winning enough big games, that, you know, Gus should have won a championship by now, uh, that I would say, no, this this really didn't surprise me. I hate it for Gus, but look, he's going to have one very Merry Christmas a- anyways with oh, yeah. that, that chunk of a buyout. So, no, n- nothing in this conference <laughs> surprises me, which is frankly what part of what makes this, you know, the kind of conference that gets the attention that it gets and makes us um, – you know, uh, people uh, that, that viewers want to watch. They want to watch what we do. They want to watch our shows because there's that much passion in this league. Dari, Gene Chizik's there on set with you a lot of nights. Yeah. What did Gene say about this when, when the news broke? Uh, what, what did he say? He's been in that position before. He knows what's Yeah, happening. you know, I don't think he was surprised. You know, he and Gus are still close. I mean, they're, you know, I think a lot of people think that, that Chiswick would have some hard feelings towards Gus because Gus took the job when Chiswick right. was fired and, and Chiswick's the reason Gus was even at Auburn. Right. But you know what? No, they've still got a good friendship. Uh, he doesn't like this for Gus, but he also has told us many times just how much pressure there is in that part of the state on whoever the coach of that program is. And uh, I don't think this shocked Chiswick at all. Um, you know, and, and, We'll see who comes in next. It's going to be really, really interesting to see what they do from here because, in my opinion, you don't make this move without having somebody lined up and ready to go, but I don't get the feeling they have somebody lined up and ready to go, not for that cost. But then you come back to who's paying that. The school's not paying the $21.7 million. Somebody else is. So, you know, uh, it's – I don't know that there's any real proper protocol here. It just We'll just see who's next whenever they decide to tell us. Yes. Well, uh, what are your thoughts about the SEC championship game tomorrow? Is there any chance that you think that Florida might could pull the upset here? Is there any chance that you think Florida could pull the upset? <laughs> no, no, not after the way that they lost to LSU. There's – Absolutely Jokes. no shot. In my mind, I don't. I don't. I'll be honest with you. I'm looking at at some point, probably mid second quarter. Yes. Before I start giving a really close look to Tulsa versus Cincinnati going on at the same time. I mean, I, I don't really know how Florida defensively is going to keep Alabama out of the end zone frequently enough to give themselves a chance. 
Um, I no, I don't see a way. I, honest to goodness, I do not see a way that this is that this is even that cl- you know relatively close. Yes. Darry, you grew up in Tulsa, Oklahoma, I do believe. Correct. That's right. Yep. Darry, who are some of the teams that you grew up watching and pulling for? Some of your favorite players. Oh, I love it. Uh, so I grew up in Tulsa. My dad was a University of Tulsa grad, big sports fan as well. And, you know, you grow up in Tulsa, you, everybody kind of likes, you know, TU. Right. But you also typically root for Oklahoma or Oklahoma State and more Oklahoma than Oklahoma State. I grew up really rooting for Oklahoma. That was the first year. I was born in 76. The first year I really remember watching college football was 1985 when Oklahoma won the national championship. Yeah. And Ron Bosworth. Boz and Jamel Holloway, right? Yeah. Those teams, exactly. Ricky Dixon, you know, a really, really good team, obviously, with Barry Switzer, and we all love Barry. So I grew up an Oklahoma fan. But I also grew up in Tulsa, and my grandparents were season ticket holders to the Sooners. Every now and then, my grandma would say, you know what, honey, why don't you take Dar? He'd love to go. So I'd get to go to Norman and watch him play. If I didn't go to Norman and Tulsa had a home game, my dad took me to the Tulsa game. So, I mean, I grew up, uh, you know, I was after Steve Largent, who went through the University of Tulsa. He's one of my dad's all-time favorites to this day. But I, I did grow up uh, a lot of games at Skelly Stadium in Tulsa. They had a team in 1991 that finished ranked, I think, 19th in the country, beat 15th-ranked Texas A&M. They lost to number one Miami, and Gino Toretta came to Tulsa and played. I mean, would that have ever happened over the last 20 years, probably not. They beat San Diego State and held Marshall Falk in check and the bowl game. So I remember those games really well and those teams. But I grew up a Sooner fan uh, and, and going to games in the 80s and going to games in the early 90s. And then I was a student at OU for four of the worst years in the history of that program. Guys, I mean, my freshman year, Gary Gibbs coached his last season. Now, he was the defensive coordinator for Switzer, but then Switzer got – fired and they went on probation so i got gary gibbs one year and then my sophomore year it's howard schnellenberger and a lot of people forget he ever even coached there yeah. and he tried all he could in his one year to drive it further into the ground <laughs> then we hired john blake yeah. uh, who recently passed away so my four years as a student at this school where i grew up watching them play for and win championships uh, I've done the math, 18 wins, 27 losses, and one tie. That that was the OU football that I got to see as a student living in Norman. Mm, wow. Yeah, not good. Not good, not good. But I do remember well, I mean, I, you know, when Bob Stoops took over and, and that 2000 team was incredibly special, I incidentally was working in local TV in Lincoln, Nebraska, covering the Huskers, who were ranked number one when they went to Norman, and, and there was a string there of three games when OU beat Kansas State. Uh, Texas, Kansas State, Nebraska, back to back to back, really started that run to number one. And uh, I would have never thought, and that's how that crazy this game is. I, I would have never thought 2000 would have been the last championship we won as we sit here in 2020. Wow. Yeah, you, you mentioned Lincoln. And of course, I'm a big college baseball fan. I know Omaha is a little oh, piece man. from Lincoln. But uh, uh, tell us about covering the Huskers and, and what is Omaha the state like? Let me rephrase that. What's Nebraska like yeah. when the College World Series comes? I, man, I'm glad you asked me that. I, I, so I was in Lincoln for two years. Uh, I got there in 2000, left in 2002. And that was one of the highlights. So I covered Nebraska. And realistically, I covered Nebraska football the last time it was nationally relevant. Right. And it was in 2000. They went, played for the national, uh, no, they, in 2001, they played Miami for the national championship in the Rose Bowl. And they got smacked. And Colorado had smacked them in the regular season before that. Realistically, they shouldn't have even been in that game, but they were. But that same year, Eric Crouch won the Heisman Trophy. Nebraska played a great 1-2 game in Lincoln against Oklahoma, and they beat the Sooners on an Eric Crouch touchdown catch down the sideline, which was kind of his Heisman moment. It was amazing, covering the Huskers. Growing up in Oklahoma, the OU-Nebraska rivalry that we would remember was never one that was like OU-Texas, where it's a rivalry of dislike. It was a real rivalry of respect. We rooted for Nebraska. They rooted for us. I mean, it was always kind of that way. And Going and covering that program was amazing. They're, to this day, they are the most loyal fan base I've ever been around, ever. Wow. Um, now, you asked me about the College World Series. That was one of the things I really couldn't wait for for the first time. I never went when I was growing up. And, and even though Omaha was only about seven hours from Tulsa, it was one hour from Lincoln. 
the first year I was in Lincoln, just I went and I took in a lot of that World Series at Rosenblatt just as a fan, just to go. What year was this? This was in 2001 baseball season. Okay, okay. Okay. 2002 season, I will never forget it because it was the first time that Nebraska had ever qualified right. for the College World Series. So you took Rosenblatt Stadium, which held 24,000 fans. You break up the eight different fan bases. And when Nebraska, their session, their first session must have been 22,000 decked out in red. And the story to get there, guys, when I tell you, like, there needs to be a book written on this because the coach at the time was Dave Van Horn, who's been at Arkansas ever since he left right. Nebraska. Nebraska baseball, as you would imagine, had never had a history. They played at this little ballpark called Buck Belzer Stadium on campus. The infield was turf. The outfield was grass because it was the Nebraska outdoor pra football practice field. Oh, wow. That was part of the outfield of Buck Belzer Stadium. There were just little pockets of grandstands. Like if you would go to whatever, you know, your local town's little league facility, it really, it, it held about 800 people because they didn't need more than that. Now, the year before that, in 2001, they got to a regional and they lost at Stanford, no, super regional. So they went through regional one, went to Stanford for their first ever super regional and got beat, but they were on the rise. Next year, still in this little dinky ballpark, they get to a regional, they host it, they're playing Rutgers. Okay, and this is a really long story, but just bear with me here. They're one win away from going to a super regional, which they in all likelihood were going to host. Rutgers, the the van, the bus pulls up. They, as they're getting off the bus, about 2,000 Nebraska fans who were waiting to get into the stadium because it was all general admission. Now, they had brought in temporary bleachers from some warehouse in Omaha. They had <laughs> trucked them into Lincoln, put them around put him in the outside or outside of the fence. It was it was incredible what they did, but they had picked up so much team. Anyway, these fans, as great as they are, Rutgers gets off the bus to a standing ovation, everybody stand, to a full ovation of respect, which Nebraska fans will obviously do. Nebraska beats Rutgers. Now it's super regional time. They are hosting and they're hosting Rice. Now this is, you're a baseball fan, okay? Wayne Graham's a legend. I got to remember Kirk Sarlos, I think, and somebody else. Rice had two big time, big time arms, and but Nebraska was hosting. This place was packed. Now we're filming all the local t Lincoln and Omaha television stations. We're all filming with our cameras. We're on top of the dugouts. Okay, right. A foul ball could knock you right off the dugout. Fortunately, it never happened. But I'll never forget final out. Rice kid pops it up to second base. Nebraska's got a second baseman, Will Bolt, who I'm trying to remember where he might have just been hired in Nebraska. I can't remember now. Goes back, makes the catch. Place erupts, goes crazy. They go to their first college World Series. And from that point on, what happened in Omaha? They got knocked two and out in Omaha. And then yeah. the next year they went two and out again in Omaha. But seeing the College World Series is one thing. Seeing it when Nebraska's in it is a totally different ball game. And, and I'll never – those were some of the greatest moments I've ever had covering this game, covering uh, sports. Very short follow-up. Uh, have you been to TD Ameritrade? Oh, yeah, I, every year. So yeah, that's yeah. part of the great thing here with this network. Every time we have an SEC team in the World Series, Peter Burns will go, and then if they reach the finals, then he'll come back and I'll go cover the finals, which I've gotten to do so many times it's insane. And, and yeah. if your follow-up to that is which one do I like better – it's Rosenblatt, and it's not even close. Thank you. I'm a massive fan of Rosenblatt. <laughs> I'm still heartbroken about that. Have you been out there since they tore the facility down? Yes. They, yes. Have you seen I, it like the, and they got the foul poles that are still up in the parking lot, and they got the little mini, like the kids' Yeah, the field. little diamond, yeah. It's, yeah. And they still use the same base. Like, it's really, really cool, yeah. It is very cool. It, it still breaks my heart. Uh, it, something about coming up Rosenblatt and coming up that hill to, to the stadium. It just – Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your, your heart skips a beat. But when you walk in and you saw the uh, uh, the, the sanctuary from the zoo out there behind the right field yeah. pole and yeah, those colored yeah, seats. The, the desert the, dome out there. Yep, yeah, exactly. yeah. The, the red, blue, and yellow seats are gold. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, uh, it, was, it was great. I mean, TD America – 
trade is great. It's it is. It's a nice. It's store. a fantastic facility. It's a great part. And downtown Omaha is very underrated. I really, really. It's a beautiful area. It's really nice and clean. Good, really good food. But it's just not the same. It, it's, it's it almost good. feels like like it's not a college event anymore. It yeah. feels more it feels more grown up, if that makes any sense. And Rosenblatt just felt like the perfect setting for a college championship to be won at. Yeah, and, and, and growing up as a kid in Northwest Mississippi, you know, uh, going to just seeing that on TV year after year after mm-hmm. year, growing up watching Clark and Palmero, because me and you are the, oh, yeah. the same age, Dari. Uh, growing up, uh, watching the College World Series on TV, and then finally going and seeing the Erector set lights and, and the crazy yeah, yeah. Uh, press box. <laughs> you know, it looks yep. like the press box built out of blue toothpicks. But, you know, uh, you, you get there, it's just – it's an eyesight. It, it's just eye candy to watch it. And, and I swear yeah. to you, uh, I tell people all the time, I said, I said, Omaha has to have the longest sunsets of any city in the world. That's uh, a good that point. sun takes forever to set out there, and it's hot, yeah. but it's beautiful. And but uh, yeah, I miss the old stadium tremendously. Yeah. I do too. Uh, it's it's it was one of the great collegiate events. Uh, you know, I've been to Final Fours and national championship football games, and they're all great. But you know, there's just something about Omaha, particularly when it was a Rosenblatt, that was tough to beat. Yeah. yeah. Well, Dari, obviously, we've talked about the Gus Malzahn situation. Uh, a lot of other teams have made coaching changes this year. Do you feel like Tennessee or anybody else in the SEC will make a change uh, in the coming days or weeks? You know, Stephen, I, I don't, I don't know. And sometimes I, I don't, I don't love getting into it because I, right. look, if Tennessee did, I think I would understand. But I don't know that I would do it yet. And and so those are like decisions sometimes that what's the relationship like between Fulmer and Pruitt, Pruitt and his assistants? What is administration? What's the president of the university feel about the situation? Do they feel like 2020 with everything everybody's been through is the right time to make this move? Do they have a guy? You hear Hugh Freeze wants that Tennessee job. I don't know enough about that to know whether that's true or not. I would imagine it probably is. Well, I don't know what Pruitt's buyout is to be exact. Do they want to pull that trigger, make that move? You know, like, would I understand it if they did? I guess so, but I hope they know who they're going to get next. And I hope that that's, you know, that it makes sense to the fan base and and to Fulmer and the administration and that it's who they want. But outside of that one, you know, I don't see a situation that's that that. You know, Vandy. I didn't. I wasn't surprised with South Carolina. I wasn't surprised with Auburn. Not particularly surprised with. This would be the only other one, and and I. You know, I just don't. I haven't. You know, there's not a whole lot of smoke around a potential fire there. So I, I just don't. No pun intended. I, I just don't necessarily see. <laughs> right. it. Dar, you you mentioned uh, uh, the SEC and, and coaches and everything, but. One coach that keeps getting mentioned on this show over and over and over is Steve Spurrier. Do you have a Steve Spurrier story? (laughs) I do. So I never really knew him until I really started covering college sports, which I I moved here from Bristol, Connecticut. After seven years up there, I moved to Charlotte to be the lead host of ESPNU. And so we did all the National Signing Day stuff and I had like a football show that I did for two years called College Football Daily. And I got to know, you know, coach quite a bit. Uh, But eventually, but the first time I ever talked to coach was on the first signing day show I did. And it wasn't in person. It was over the phone. And somebody had apparently said to him, you know, you'll be talking to Dari. And he may not have necessarily caught it. And so I asked him a question. I'm now I'm on the set with Tom Luganville and a couple other people. (laughs) And I said, you know, I asked him this question and he goes, his answer is, well, Darcy, I tell you. And he started on this answer. And Luganville is to my left laughing hysterically. Like he – and I look at him, and I'm not on camera, and I look at him, and he's got his head his head like on the desk <laughs> because Spurrier just called me Darcy. And so to this day, Luganville calls me Darcy. <laughs> but about – Three, four years ago, whenever the the media, the first college football or SEC media day in Atlanta was, we had Spurrier on the set as a guest. 
And apparently somebody had said something to him. So I asked him a question. And before he answers the question, he looks at me across the, across the desk and he said, somebody said I called you Darcy once. Did I call you Darcy? And I said, Coach, you did. It's all good. You call me whatever you want. He goes, well, okay, Darcy. And he just made sure to fin- just make – it was clear d- that he knew my name this time. And he just went on with his answer. But it was pretty classic Spurrier. That's pretty funny. We had Tom Lugabell <laughs> on the show, and he always said that Spurrier called him Little Loogie. He said, he said never <laughs> see him. He always calls me Loogie. Hey, Little Loogie. That's pretty funny. Doesn't surprise me, though. That's funny. So, yeah. Hey, uh, keeping it with the host and, and antics and fun, uh, what's yeah. something that's happened uh, offset? Some big trash talking, uh, maybe between, you know, uh, Coach Chase, yeah. anybody. But what's what's some fun trash talking that's happened or a fun story that you can share with us that's happened off camera there? At, uh, yeah, at so Network? before Chiswick joined uh, us, like on the Friday night, Saturday night show, uh, it was Booger. And, and and so Booger McFarland, obviously, big LSU guy. Right. And I tell you what. One of the best Saturdays of any given year was me just sitting in that studio when LSU played Florida because Booger and Doring <laughs> were ruthless and they would go at it. And they would, I mean, you know, like all of these guys that I work with have these incredible, everybody will tell you, you'll play in the NFL, you will never identify yourself with an NFL team the way that you will always identify yourself with your college team. Right. Correct. Marcus yes. Spears loves the Dallas Cowboys still spent all but one year of his career with the Dallas Cowboys. He identifies himself as an LSU Tiger. That's just the way that it is. Booger, same thing, right? He won a Super Bowl with the Colts. He won a Super Bowl with the Buccaneers. He's an LSU Tiger. So even this past Saturday night, Chiswick, Doring and, and, and myself are doing the show in the middle of the show. Doring and I get a text from Booger and all it says is, it's great to be a Florida Gator <laughs> after LSU had just beaten Florida. Classic stuff and a phenomenal Twitter ex- the text exchange uh, continues for, you know, the next two days between between the three of us. Pretty good stuff. But, like, I mean, that's the thing. That's I don't know that the average fan uh, – you know, people that watch this, I think, know it. We're all college people. But it's so true, and it doesn't matter if it's baseball. You know, Chris Burke uh, – yeah. Let, help lead the Houston Astros to a World Series, right? I mean, he's not in his world a Houston Astro. He's a Tennessee volunteer. It doesn't right. matter what sport it is. It doesn't – you are identified and you identify yourself with the school that you played for. That's who you represent. And whatever happens beyond that, you want to win, you want to make a lot of money, you want to retire comfortably and all that, but you're still going to be an LSU Tiger, a Florida Gator, an Alabama Crimson Tide, you know, what have you. Well, let's keep it on that story. Uh, you know, you said earlier when we were off the air that you had a pretty interesting a little tidbit backstage, uh, an offset, uh, when mm-hmm. Saban and Feinbaum got into it that time at SC yeah. Media Days. What can you tell us about that exchange? That got tense now. That, that, you, you guys remember. So the story was Cam Robinson had been, try to remember, right? He was caught in Louisiana. I think he had drugs in the car. This was Alabama's offensive lineman at the time. Saban had not announced any sort of a punishment at that point. Now, Alabama was going to open the season in Arlington against Southern Cal. No punishment had been handed down for Saban. Saban comes up to the, God, there's a lot to this story. Saban goes up to the podium to do his, his deal. We know that after he's done, with the mass of media, he's going to come to our set, which is right behind them in, in Hoover. So he's up the podium. And Paul and I had been talking off air about how, you know, somebody's going to ask him, you know, what, what's your plan with Cam Robinson? Is Cam Robinson going to be suspended? Or are you going to let him play against Southern Cal? Whatever it might be, there's going to be a question. 28 minutes come and go. Nobody's asked him about Cam. Nobody's asked him. And I'm looking at Paul, and Paul's looking at me, and we're like, you know, we're across the set. I'm on one end, he's on the other. And we're like, hands in the air, like, what the hell's happening here? Like, nobody's going to ask the guy? <laughs> 30 minutes comes and goes. Nobody asks him. We come on camera. 
we're discussing the fact that nobody had asked it. What should happen with Cam Robinson? What would you do? All right, well, I'll tell you what, you know, we'll talk to Nick Saban about it ourselves. We'll get to the bottom of this, you know, right here on SEC Now. He'll join us next on SEC Now. We are going to break. My microphone was not supposed to be on, but it was on. And I said, gee, Paul, you think he owns the media? <laughs> that went out on the air. <laughs> so we come we come back from break. Actually, we're about 30 seconds out. And I'm not sure that it went out on the air, but I was pretty sure. And Paul kind of snaps at me from across the set. And I look at me, he goes, check your Twitter. So I get on Twitter. And I'm like, crap, it went out on the air. Like, and everybody's like, oh, you think Saban owns the media? Dari calling out the media, whatever. Because nobody asked that question. And for the record, uh, Nick Saban in many cases owns the media. Let's let's not be mistaken. <laughs> so we come back on, own up to the fact that I said that. Paul, and then I said, I mean, I said it because how do you go 30 minutes and nobody asks it? Paul right. goes, Dari, you were right. Nick Saban does own the media. So we talk about it. Okay, then Nick Saban comes on a few minutes later. Paul starts hammering. I think a lot of people would remember that, right? right. Are you not going to, you know, you're not going to punish Cam Robinson? He got arrested. Or I don't know. I'm trying to remember. I think he got arrested, but there were no charges filed. Nick's talking about how, you know, we're, we're going to let this play out. and We're still looking into it. Not going to do it. And Paul challenges him. Now, Nick doesn't like when somebody challenges him. That, that's not something that's going to go over well. And so he says on the air, Paul, you don't know all that you think you know, right? And that was pretty much it. But you can see it boiling up. We end up thanking Nick, and we go to break. And in the break is when it got interesting. Because it was me and McElroy, and I don't remember, maybe Booger. I don't remember. Marcus maybe was on the set. It wouldn't, Yeah, it would have been Marcus, I think. So Saban gets out of his chair and he walks to the front of the desk. And now he's staring across at Paul. And he starts, and I won't repeat a lot of what he said, but his point was, Paul, do you know what really ticks me off? And, it, and then he gets to the point where it's when everybody thinks they know everything about every little story, but they're not in the building and they're not on the field and they're not having the conversation. And quite frankly, he's damn right. Because that led us to having this conversation when we came back from break about how he will literally stand up for his teammates. Everybody knows he's got their back. That's why one of the reasons people go play for him, you know, and to his credit, I mean, he it, it, he's right. Like that's, we didn't know everything, right? but I hadn't seen him snap like that. And Paul was like, okay. Cause Paul and Nick have always had a good relationship and I believe they still do. But that was a side of Nick I've not seen in person. And I, I won't forget that one. Dari, me and you are roughly the same age. I'm a couple of months older, uh, per Wikipedia. <laughs> uh, uh, that's all true. I think that thing's right about my birth date, so I think we're accurate. <laughs> <laughs> are, are you still married to the same people who have the same amount of kids? <laughs> I think so. I, I, I haven't checked it, but I have not. I'm married almost 18 years, so I assume it, it's the same. Per yeah. It's the only person I've ever been married to. So if it says Jennifer, then yes, it's the, it's the same person. <laughs> uh, with, that, with that being said, uh, uh, tell us a non-sports uh, celebrity or person that you ran into that you kind of grew up watching, adoring, liking, admiring, whatever it might Ooh. be. But uh, who's someone that you kind of ran into like, wow, I'm, I'm like here with them right now having a conversation. Uh, what kind of situation have you been uh, uh, thrown into where uh, wow. that's come to play? That's a really good question. Um, you know, it's um, – golly. I'll tell you what, what kind of a cool moment was when I was in Bristol and I was sitting in the newsroom. You know, a lot of times they'll have just kind of people come in. They might do a commercial or this is sports in a commercial or right. they'll come and do a, some sort of an interview. So I'm sitting in the newsroom and all of a sudden uh, – and I'm sitting there just banging away on this computer – and I realized somebody sits in the seat next to me, but I don't really think anything. I didn't even look over there because I was like really trying to get something done. And then I look over there and I'm like, okay, that's Matthew McConaughey sitting here. <laughs> so Matthew McConaughey comes up for some Texas thing, right? Some Longhorns related dealy and probably talk about a movie or something. I'm not sure. And, uh, 
so I just introduced myself and, uh, you know, he's, he's wearing some burnt orange stuff. And I go, of course, it's nice to meet you, but I'm a sooner just for the record. And so we had this great, he was waiting to go on 10 minute conversation about Texas and OU and, and that great rivalry there and talking about some cool memories, which was really cool. Um, in here, uh, first year of the SEC Network, actually, Darius Rucker uh, yeah. came in, and, and I did a couple of segments with him. Uh, and good. we had a really good conversation and exchanged numbers. So, uh, in fact, la the last concert I was at before COVID hit, uh, you know, Darius got us backstage passes, my son and I, to go see. It was it was Hootie and the Blowfish, um, you know, yeah. not not him and doing country, although he did some country, but it was Hootie and the Blowfish with Bare Naked Ladies, which was a phenomenal show. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's, I don't know, it's, you know, not a ton of, well, there's another one. So again, celebrities will sometimes, when, especially in Bristol, they'll just come walk through, right? They'll do, come, like I said, commercials or whatever. So Will Ferrell was in promoting Talladega Night. And Robert Smith and I were doing a college football live show. And we were in what's called a screening set. Right. So in front of the set, is glass windows. So if you're walking down our hallway, a certain hallway, you can look in and see the show. We're in the middle of a show and I kind of look up because there's all this commotion behind the windows and Will Ferrell has his face pressed against the glass <laughs> with his hands up for, it must have been a minute, minute and a half. And Robert and I in the middle of a live show are laughing our butts off. Because Will Ferrell's got his entire face pushed up against the glass because he knows we're on television. Pretty yeah. funny moment there, too. Very nice. <laughs> hey, to follow that up, uh, uh, again, we're roughly the same age. Uh, who's a sports celebrity that when you were talking to him, interviewing him, you're like, man, I can't believe I am talking to so-and-so. Well, so um, I try not to get too, like, you know, right. caught up in, in, that, in that stuff. But I, I know this. I'll go back to, again, when I was in Bristol, it was 2005. I had uh, started at ESPN in 2004, June that year. And that first year, I really had done mostly ESPN news shows. I hadn't gotten to, you know, break into sports center or anything else. But I remember I was off on a day and I had expressed an interest in Major League Baseball. I love baseball. I love hockey, baseball, you name it. But I had said, um, you know, it'd be a dream of mine at some point down the road to get to host baseball tonight. So right. I'm sitting at home one day. I'd only been there about eight, nine months. I get a phone call. Hey, we need a fill in kind of an emergency fill in on baseball tonight. Could you make it in? Now I used to watch baseball tonight religiously. And right. so I said, Oh my God. Okay, sure. I don't know who's on the show with me. I have no idea. Lifelong Dodger fan. So I'm still enjoying this world series, but lifelong Dodger. fan. And I remember 1988, like it was yesterday. Right. Right. So, I walk into our meeting and it's the producers and stuff. And I'm kind of late getting there because I got a late call. And I realized that the only people on the air that day were going to be oh. me and Oral Hershot. Yeah. yeah. And I was like that. Now, that was that was kind of cool. I'm calling all my friends and my family. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm about to do baseball tonight with Oral Hershiser. He couldn't have been nicer. And so that was pretty cool. But, um, you know, I, I grew up a big Dodgers fan. Uh, and an OU fan, you know, more than anything else. And so kind of getting that opportunity to, to, to work with him and get to know Oral was pretty cool. That is very cool. Well, I have two final questions for you. One is sure. you said that you are an Oklahoma fan. Can you kind of break down the Big 12 championship game for us tomorrow? You know, I, Iowa State, I think, is really good. Um, obviously they beat Oklahoma earlier in the season. Brees Hall is a legit tailback. Uh, but I'm, you know, <laughs> past years don't have a lot to do with this year, but I'm going to say this anyways, Oklahoma doesn't lose these games, right? There's a reason they've won what some 75% of big 12 championships since 2000. They've gotten better over the course of the season. Their biggest bugaboo in the last 15 years seems to be on the rise, and that's defense. When they played Iowa State the first time, they did not have their leading rusher, Ramondre Stevenson. They did not have uh, their, their top pressure guy either. So, look, they're healthy. Defensively, they're a top 15 defense nationally. 
And this is the Big 12 championship game. It's hard enough to beat a team twice. It's, I would consider it almost impossible when it's an Oklahoma team that's playing its best football of the year. So I think Oklahoma wins this. Uh, I think they win it by three or four touchdowns, to be honest. Maybe I'm underselling Iowa State, and I appreciate them and what Matt Campbell does. I, I don't see them beating Oklahoma twice. And my last question for you, Dory, is this. You are a Tulsa graduate can you or alum. Can you talk about the Tulsa-Cincinnati game tomorrow, and yeah. do you feel like Tulsa will knock them off? I'll say that I'm an Oklahoma alum, but I, I didn't grow up in Tulsa. I got you. Okay. Uh, so I will be rooting for Tulsa, and I always do root for Tulsa um, as well. But, you know, I, I don't. I would love to have seen that game last week at Tulsa, the regular season game that was scheduled. I, I, Tulsa's very good. Tulsa's got a potential first-round defensive player in Zayvon Collins, a linebacker. That guy that just picked off that pass. Yes. Right. Good to the house. Good timing there, right? That dude could be a first round, which wouldn't surprise anybody. But Cincinnati and Desmond Ritter and that quarterback and his mobility combined with a defense that I think is underappreciated. No, I think Cincinnati wins, but I think it could be a good fourth quarter ball game. Yes. Dari, my last question for you is, is going back to Oklahoma a little bit. The new head coach at South Carolina, Shane Beamer, uh, he's yeah. left Mormon. He's coming to Columbia. His wife, Emily, and I work together. Uh, and my first TV gig in Starkville, uh, we worked together briefly. But oh, nice. what do you expect out of uh, uh, Shane going to South Carolina? Is it something that he can rejuvenate that program and start it on the Ross? I mean, from the time his name first came up, there was a rejuvenation of that program, it yeah. felt like. You know, I'm a big Will Muschamp fan. I'm not saying he shouldn't have lost his job. I totally get it. But I will say this. He helped get that program to a place in terms of facilities, mm -hmm. in terms of what is on that campus, big football only complex, practice field offices, frankly, everything that you have to have in this league to be able to have a chance. He helped develop that. He helped make that happen. And Shane Beamer is going to walk into a situation that is better than the one Will Muschamp walked into. They may not have won enough games. I understand that. But Beamer is a phenomenal recruiter, as we know. He knows this area very well. He had a lot of luck. If you look up and down Oklahoma's roster where he's been the last three years, you'll see kids from Georgia, kids from the Carolinas. You'll see kids from Tennessee, kids that he brought in. Right. He knows the area. And if he can recruit them there, he'll be able to recruit them to Columbia, South Carolina just fine. So, no, I think from an energetic standpoint, from a fan base being fired up standpoint, look, He's got a last name people know. That does matter as well. He's familiar with this program. He's won with this program as an assistant and as a recruiting director. So I, I think he's got a good a chance, frankly, as winning there as, as anybody else would. Well, Dari, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us. And I'm going to pull you up full screen. And if you would like to tell people how they can donate to uh, Hayden's Hope, Feel free to sure. let them know. I appreciate it. I appreciate it, guys. Thank you all for having me. Yeah, our uh, our foundation is called Hayden's Hope. Uh, we started in 2011 after we lost a child uh, who was in need of a heart transplant. And uh, what we do is we raise money for families who have children awaiting a life-saving organ transplant. Mm -hmm. We're associated with Children's Organ Transplant Association, or CODA, C-O-T-A. Uh, 100 because CODA handles the administrative costs, 100% of everything we raise through Hayden's Hope does go to those families. Um, you can find out more information at haydenshope.org. You can make a donation at haydenshope.org, and uh, we're thankful and appreciative for anything that anybody wants to contribute uh, because there's families that we've helped really from coast to coast uh, over the nine years that we've, that we've done this. So anyway, uh, appreciate any of my producer, Brad, just came over here for our, our show tonight. But um, any and all help is appreciated, and uh, we appreciate. I appreciate you guys. Let me let me mention it. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. And uh, if we don't talk to you before then, we hope you guys have a very merry Christmas. Hey, same to you guys. Thank you very Thank much. You. All right, Thanks, Dory. Man, I got to tell you that was an exciting interview, and we do want to thank Dory for taking time out of his busy Friday afternoon. 
up there at the SEC Network to take time and join us. Yeah, Stephen, I know we were talking in post-production uh, uh, earlier this week uh, of some things we could do for Christmas shows. I think we should have a Christmas show of nothing but Spurrier stories. Uh, everyone's yeah. got a Spurrier story. Yes. So, uh, yeah, so to, <laughs> but for him to call him Darcy, uh, that's hilarious. Coach Spurrier yeah. calling Darry Darcy. But, uh, yeah, that's that's fun stuff. But, yeah, always great to have Darry on. I've always respected him uh, as a journalist and especially as an anchor. Uh, he is one of the best. And uh, I did not know his passion for baseball as yes. much as mine, college and pro. So I would – I would really hate to see him leave SEC Network, but hey, if Baseball Tonight called me, Stephen, I would no longer do the Stingray Show. You darn right. You said that. <laughs> hey, are you ready to go to the soundbite of the week? Uh, we actually did not get to play this on Tuesday, but this one is quite fun. Do it. Yeah, I, I don't. You know, that's just product of when your players play well, you're going to be in rumors like that. So there's been no conversations, anything like that. Um, I wanted to say, um, you know, what I learned from my mentor, um, you know, that if you guys are going to keep asking this, I'm going to have to tell you, I will not be the head coach at Alabama, okay? So stop asking me. I wasn't supposed to say that, but I just had to. <laughs> that is classic, classic Lane Train, Lane Kiffin, man. I wish uh, the Ole Miss media was a little bit more in tune and, and, and would have laughed or giggled or something. There was no reaction there, but uh, that was absolutely hilarious. Uh, I, I doubt that the uh, uh, Ole Miss media uh, had any clue of the reference of Saban talking about when he was with the Dolphins that he had no interest in the Alabama job. Stop asking me. And but then that two was, hours later, he was on the plane. Yeah, that's absolutely hilarious. Uh, and by the way, let's go back. Uh, we didn't have a shot or chance to do this last weekend, or I should say on Tuesday. Let's run through real quick what I like to call the catch of the week. And I showed you this earlier, uh, and this was a phenomenal catch. Uh, in the LSU versus Florida game, it was an amazing tipped interception, one of two interceptions uh, that Kyle Trask threw on the night. This one was impressive as it was tipped off of the, it was thrown right off the defender's helmet up into the air, doink, and then the guy on the ground on his knees catches it inbounds, and it was a confirmed catch. Now, if the Florida man would have touched the ball, then it would have been incomplete because he was out of bounds, but it did not touch him, and it was actually called a catch completion on the field and an interception. That is incredible by Ward right there. Hey, it happened the exact way Bo Pelini drew it up. Yes, that's right. <laughs> All right, man. Well, are you ready to bring on our second guest of the afternoon? Oh, man, yeah. This is a big-time interview, and we want to thank this guy for taking time out of his busy schedule to join us. Well, Heath, as you can see, I've got my red shirt on because we actually have a Georgia Bulldog joining us on the show today. And believe it or not, he was the MVP of the SEC championship game back in 2005. Uh, this guy had a long time to sit behind David Green at Georgia, but in 2005, he finally got his a uh, chance to start, and boy, did he make the best of it there at Georgia, winning an SEC championship for the Georgia Bulldogs under head coach Mark Richt. Without further ado, Heath, let's go in and bring in our very special guest for today, ladies and gentlemen, the one, the only, Mr. DJ Shockley. DJ, how are you doing today, my friend? Hey, I'm doing good, man. I appreciate that introduction, man. I tell you, I got to take you on the road with me sometimes because that intro was pretty cool. But uh, all is good, man. Doing well. Been a crazy year. Been a crazy 2020 for everybody I know. But uh, excited we had ball this year and uh, looking forward to talking to you guys. Yes. DJ, before we get going, tell us, tell us a, a fun story on and off the field about Coach Mark Rick. Oh, uh, I go back to uh, when he was recruiting me. 
He was at Florida State at the time, and uh, it's a pretty funny story. We laugh about it to it now, but uh, he was at Florida State. I was at their little team gala, and I'm um, sitting there, and he's talking to me. He's like, yeah, everybody called me shock. He's like, yeah, shock, everybody. You know, we would love to have you at Florida State. You'll be a great fit for us. You can do a lot of great things here. I would love to have you at Florida State. So I was like, okay, cool. So I'm thinking about going to Florida State. Two weeks later, he takes the Georgia job, and the day he takes the Georgia job, he's sitting in my living room. And he's sitting in my living room, and he says, you know what, Shock? I think Georgia would be the best place for you. I think you would be great here. I think you could do some great things. And I'm like, Coach, you say the same thing about Florida State. He said, basically, uh, you know I'm the coach for you. You know what I mean by that. So we still laugh about it to this day that uh, he gave me the, the same pitch for Florida State as he did for Georgia, but basically it was all about uh, – me coming to play for him, which was uh, pretty cool. And um, the thing on the field that makes him pretty cool is what you see on TV, what you see when he's on air views, that's who he is. He is yeah. the down to earth, just a real salt to earth guy, just a real outstanding guy. And I think the, um, the most important thing is he cares about you. He wants you to be a better man, brother, husband, uh, man of God, all those things that he is really passionate about. But uh, if you make him mad now, he will let you know. Yeah. And uh, at the end of the day, though, he will come back and, and try to make it right. But uh, great guy. I love talking to Coach Rick, and he's always been one of my favorite people. I got you. Well, uh, with the SEC championship game uh, being this weekend, can you kind of tell us your experience of actually going through and winning an SEC championship game and what that game was like? for you personally back in 2005? It's an unbelievable moment. I tell you, um, like you mentioned when we first came on, it took a long time for me to get to that spot where I got a chance to start, play behind Greeny for, you know, those three, four years. Um, but then when I finally got the opportunity and then to be able to play in that ball game was huge because I had always, I played in it once or twice as a backup, but never as the guy that helped lead us there. So, yeah. Uh, to, to be in that ball game and then to take our team to that particular stage where at the beginning of the year, we started the year versus Boise State, and everybody thought we would lose our first game at home. We'd be the only upset of the weekend. And everybody said, ah, oh, they lost David Green. They lost David Pollock. They lost Thomas Davis. This Georgia team is going to be rebuilding. And the fact that we were able to get through that whole year and get to that SC championship game, we felt we had earned some respect. And then we get there and we play at LSU, who is number three. They got Jamarcus Russell. You know, if they win, they go play the national championship. And to completely boat race them was uh, fun. And I tell you, it was probably the most satisfying and gratifying thing that I, I was able to be a part of because of all the things we had to go through that year. And then to finally say, hey, I'm an SEC champion quarterback. I helped this team get to this particular spot. Uh, was pretty cool and doing it against a team like LSU, who was number three at the time, was uh, was pretty cool. Keith, you're back with us, man. Yeah, a little little technical difficulty there. I apologize for that. <laughs> you're you're good, man. So, uh, DJ, with the SEC championship, and, and I know the game has moved from the Georgia Dome, but walking into the stadium and everything as a player and walking into that, what is that like? It's pretty cool because I remember when we did it back in 05, like we always had what's called the dog walk in Athens, walking into the stadium. And somehow Coach Rick was able to create the dog walk as we walked into the Georgia Dome that particular year. And all the Georgia fans were lined up, uh, ready to go. Our buses pull up and you get a chance and you pull up. And the, mo the most surreal thing is not even when you get there, but when you're pulling up and you see this massive place and you're like, this place is going to be packed out, and now everybody's coming to watch you guys play. It's pretty cool. And then to walk up and walk through the crowd of Georgia people and then to get inside the stadium. And uh, I'll tell you, one of the coolest moments I'll never, I'll never ever forget is uh, we're about to start the game, and the captains are about to walk out. And we're walking out, and I'm at the edge. I'm at the bottom of the tunnel, and I'm about to walk up through the tunnel, and you can just see a, just a, a mass of people. And you walk out, and you look up, and it's just packed. People are going crazy. Uh, that feeling is probably like none other uh, than that you can feel as a player walking out into that stadium and knowing it's for everything. But more than that, it's uh, 
the only game on, everybody's watching, and uh, it actually means something. You know, DJ, I, I want to give you huge, huge props on something. Today's players, they just transfer as soon as they see a little bit of adversity, it seems like. Uh, yeah. But you stuck it out. You were a very high recruit. Uh, you came to Georgia. Uh, and, of course, David Green was there. But you didn't leave the program. And you stuck with it, and you stayed there. And, and then you had a phenomenal senior year. And, and as we see there in the highlights, you know, you were the MVP of the SEC championship game. But – Talk about the years before that, when you weren't the starter. What made you stay there in Athens? It was tough, I tell you. Uh, as a guy who was always, quote, unquote, the guy growing up from middle school, high school, um, it was tough to sit there those three, four years and play sparingly, come in and play three, four series a game and uh, not get a chance to play uh, as much as you wanted to. It was tough, I'll be honest. Um, I had never been in that spot, but I learned – so much about myself. I learned so much about uh, the person I was going to and growing into be. Um, I found out how mentally tough I could be. But I think the number of, there were a couple of reasons that um, made me stay at Georgia. And I, I give you this quick story. Um, before we played the Sugar Bowl, I think it's 02, 03, one of the years, uh, when I'm thinking about transferring, I go in and I talk to Coach Rick. And he knows I'm thinking about transferring. I was his first recruit to Georgia, so no coach ever wants to, you know, lose any recruits, let alone their first recruit. Right. And um, I go in his office. I'm like, Coach, you know what, man? You know, I really would love to play. I love Georgia, but I really want to play. I feel like, you know, there's a possible chance for me to go somewhere else. And he stopped me. He said, Shock, listen, I can't – I'm not going to sit here and lie to you and say, hey, we're going to offer you X amount of games you can start. Uh, I'm not going to say you're going to play this amount. I'm not saying you're going to be the guy to come next year. But one thing I do know is you're going to leave Athens with a smile on your face. You're going to leave Georgia with a, uh, a degree. And uh, most importantly, uh, we love you. And at the end of the day, when I left, that was probably the most important thing that I got was I got a guy who actually cares about me personally, but mm -hmm. also I know where I stand. And you think about this day and age, um, Sometimes players don't know where they stand with their coaches. They don't know how they feel about them. They don't know if they're going to have an opportunity. And I felt I knew everything I needed to know about him and his program. I'm a Georgia boy, so I knew my degree from there would mean a lot later on in life. Right. And, and, and ultimately, I looked at it as I signed my letter of intent to play at a place, not just when things were good, but also when things weren't going my way. And I always wanted to be known as a guy who was a, good, a man of character and a guy that you can always depend on. And Athens is not a bad place to be either. But uh, I wanted people to know that uh, I'm a dependable guy. Regardless of the situation, you can always depend on me. And then also I had something to prove. I wanted to prove to the Bulldog Nation that I could take this team to new heights and play it you know, at, a, at a high level. And ultimately, once I made a decision, I said, no looking back. I worked my tail off and said, hey, let's go get it. That you did, man. Hey, I want to ask you about this Georgia Bulldog team, obviously, because that's your alma mater. Uh, what do you feel like Georgia is missing for them ultimately to take the next step and actually compete with teams like Alabama and LSU? Do you think it's a quarterback position? Do you feel like it's another offensive coordinator? What do you think is holding Georgia back right now? To be honest, I think the last three ball games we saw what Georgia did. They needed a guy at that quarterback position that could demand the passing game, that could demand the line of scrimmage. And I thought JT Daniels came in and showed that. And you look at the previous ball games. You say, where are the Georgia receivers? Are they they're not making any plays? Well, they needed somebody to get them to rock. Right. And you saw that last couple of ball games. You saw George Pickens come out and play big. Burton, Kears, Jackson. Uh, they even tried to get the tight ends involved. So I think they have the pieces in place, to be honest. They're very young on the offensive side of the ball. They're going to bring all their skilled guys back next year. This could be a season next year where we was like, wow, where did Joe Burrow come from? Wow, where did Kyle Trask come from? Well, wow. Yeah, We saw a little bit of what JT Daniels could do in yes. this offense. So uh, Georgia could be the team next year with the amount of talent they have at receiver, which looks similar to what 
uh, the teams who are at the top of the list who are playing in the SC Championship game this week. Yeah, they have talented, fast, big, physical receivers, tight ends, and Georgia's heading that way, and they're always going to have the back. So this is going to be a talented Georgia offense next year. That's going to be really tough to beat. Hey, sticking with Georgia and the team next year, what wide receivers do you think are going to have breakout seasons? Hey, you know, I always thought that Georgia was lacking a little bit with wide receivers uh, here this past year, but who's someone that we should watch out for or several people we should watch out for there in Athens? They got a kid named Aaron Smith who they're really excited about. He had a touchdown catch in the South Carolina game, but they're comparing him to a similar speed like a Devontae Smith. Uh, he's a track oh, kid, wow. can run really fast. Uh, they're just taking him time to get used to uh, the system, but he's a freshman this year. Uh, along with him, you got Jermaine Burton. You got Blaylock, who was hurt the last couple of years, who was a really big player for him as a freshman. And then you bring in the big dude and, and George Pickens. That's four legit receivers that Georgia will have that's going to be oh, tough man. on opposing defenses next year. So, uh, Aaron Smith and Jermaine Burton, two younger guys who are freshmen this year, who absolutely people will know their name next year. Gotcha. Hey, uh, uh, I'm fixing to change uh, our family-friendly show to a maybe not family-friendly fr- uh, show with your answer. Give us your favorite Larry Munson story. He's playing what amounts to a 4-4 fake. And there's a touchdown! Touchdown, my God, a touchdown! We threw it to, we threw it to Hange. We just stepped up a five seconds left. My God Almighty, did you see what he did? David Green just straightened up, and we snuck the fullback over. Haynes is keeping the ball. Haynes has come running all the way across to the bench. We just dumped it over. It's 26 to 24. We just stepped on their face with a hobnail boot and broke their nose. We just crushed their face. We dumped it over. David Green brought us flying down the field. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh man! Well, I, I think I think it had to go back to um, uh, it has to be a favorite call. I mean, the hobnail boot call when yeah. I was there uh, when we played Tennessee when we hadn't beat Tennessee in a long time at Tennessee, and uh, just the pure emotion of we just stepped on their throats. I mean, it's just it's awesome to hear uh, Larry Munson have those kind of calls and. Hobnail boot is something that I know lives on forever in the, the lore. Uh, even if you're not a Georgia fan, people remember that particular call when you hear. So it's always cool. I mean, it's kind of similar to uh, when people hear the call from the Auburn guy with the with the with the, the six call, the kick six yeah, call, the and, kick six you know, call. Yeah. takes all the way back. So like some some calls are just ones you never can uh, forget, and it, it's pretty fun to be a part of them. Well, uh, I want to ask you a, a fun story, if you don't mind. Uh, your broadcast partner, Dave Neal, can you tell us a fun story about Dave that you guys have encountered? Oh, man, Dave is uh, one of the funniest guys I've, I've had to be around for a, a while. and we've, uh, we've been in the booth together the last three years. And um, one thing about Dave is, that people don't know is he is like a uh, mini producer. Like he's the play-by-play guy, but we have calls and he is the guy saying, hey, let's do this, let's do that, let's do this. And our producer always like, Dave, do you want to be the producer? You want to produce this show? <laughs> uh, Dave, absolutely. I mean, the dude's been doing it for 20 years. He's a legend at it. Um, Dave has to have his sweet tea in the booth. Um, <laughs> he, brings, he brings like three or four of these sweet teas and it has to be this particular kind. Um, and he always has to have it in the booth with him. And I remember our first game together, um, we're calling the game, and I think I might have said something was great, like four or five uh, plays. During the break, he says, shot, look, every play can't be great. So we got to find another way to say it. So uh, I I remember that moment uh, since then. I don't think I used the word great since then. So uh, uh, Dave, Dave is a great dude, man. He's an awesome guy. And uh, he's a definite legend in the game. You know, uh, when we had Dave on the show, uh, it was a fantastic show. He, he gave so many great stories. But he, he talked about his his dad a good bit, uh, Bob Neal, who was a legend here in SEC circles. He used to call the TBS yeah. game of the week. Uh, yeah. uh, have you ever met his dad? And does he ever talk about his dad? Oh, absolutely. Um, I've met his dad a few times during my days. And obviously he was had a chance to 
to call some of mine, you know, early in my career. Um, I remember Dave, uh, his dad had a birthday during one of our games and uh, Dave didn't know it. And I had our crew set it up where, you know, we put something on the screen and wish his dad happy birthday. He was real, he was real choked up about it, which was uh, really cool to see. Uh, but yeah, he absolutely, you know, says he learned everything from his dad. Yeah. Uh, the way he delivers things, the way he goes about his business. Uh, so he, he has some good steps to follow in for sure uh, to get to the point where he's at. You know, Dave mentioned one time that uh, we asked him, uh, what's one piece of advice that your dad passed along to you? And he said, it's how you treat people, how the, the people that you treat on the crew, the people you run into, the, the anybody's, uh, he goes, everybody. And yeah. he talked about that. So when you first met Dave and y'all started working together, what was that like? Well, uh, it, it's, it's interesting because the first time um, we started working together, uh, I found out we were going to be partners together. And uh, I tried to call him. I tried to text him. And this was like, you know, like June or July. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, why isn't this guy calling me back? Why isn't he texting <laughs> me back? What is the deal? But then I came to realize that he had just came off doing basketball season. Then he just came up with mm. baseball season. He literally said he shut his phone off. He wanted to decompress. He was going to come back to everybody then. And I thought, man, I hope he's not just avoiding me like, oh, man, who's this guy I'm with now again? But uh, it wasn't <laughs> that. He was just trying to uh, decompress and uh, get ready for the season to come. But uh, it was fun working with him, man, because he was a true legend. He's been, like I said, been around 20 years calling games. Uh, like you said, back from the Jefferson pilot days. So mm -hmm. nothing, uh, nothing really uh, gets by him at all about uh, what's happening in the game and surprise endings and all that stuff. Um, like he handles the situation the best. I remember this year we had the Vanderbilt game where Sarah Fuller was getting her first chance to play. And it was, you know, a big deal around the country. Everybody was watching and um, I asked him, you know, hey, you're going to have an opportunity to be the first right. you know, voice that people hear when, you know, they're watching this. Like, what is that like? What do you, you got some plan? He's like, no, nah, man, I got to treat it like everything else. I understand the magnitude of it, but I have to treat it just like everything else because if I try to overcomplicate it, I will mess up a really, really good situation. And yeah. I know that's something that he wanted to make sure was paid off the right way. And uh, I was blessed to, you know, have a chance to be on that call and to have some remarks about it. Uh, but it's just pretty cool that he takes everything in the same grain of salt and says, hey, I will still do my job, but I will make sure that it's given the proper due that uh, it deserves. Well, uh, speaking of the SEC championship game, obviously that is the big topic this weekend. Would you please give us your breakdown of how you see this game playing out? This is going to be an interesting game. I think, uh, obviously, the, the game last week with Florida and LSU and uh, shoe gate and everything uh, absolutely uh, makes it a little bit less intriguing because Florida now, even if they do win, I don't think they probably get into the college football playoff. But I still think Florida comes in here and early this, this will be a ball game. Um, mm -hmm. If – Florida's defense can sustain? I don't know. That's another question because Alabama has been tough to stop all year long. But if I'm Florida, I got to take away something from Alabama. And right now, nobody has been able to take away both things for Alabama. Najee Harris, 22 touchdowns. Devontae Smith, you know, he's got 15 touchdowns. They're hitting the big plays. But you got to take away one of them. And I thought LSU at times did a good job last week um, in the Florida game, I've taken away some things that Florida does well by dropping eight in the coverage, something that we saw Arkansas do early in the year to a lot of teams, but dropping eight in the coverage, not allowing the deep throw down the field. So does Florida kind of do some of that in this ball game? Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, the two quarterbacks are the big story in this, uh, but I still think Najee Harris may be the biggest uh, point in this game that everybody kind of is looking at as an afterthought because if they get that run game going, and you have to add more guys to the box. Well, here comes Mechie. Here comes uh, Devontae Smith. They got a lot of dudes that can, you know, take the top off the defense. And Florida has to pick out which one do they want to uh, be cut right. by, I should say, because they got a chance to, to be cut by an Alabama team in multiple ways. But Florida can put up points, no doubt, man. I mean, they're just as talented on the offensive side of the ball. 
Uh, it'd be interesting to see if Florida's defense, though, which I think is the true uh, big part of this game, can slow anything down from out. DJ staying in the SEC but getting away from this game. Uh, you guys get to eat at a lot of fun places across the SEC. What are some of your favorite restaurants uh, that you've gotten to eat in your favorite SEC towns? Oh, man, what's interesting is this past year, of course, because of COVID, we haven't been, able, been out as much. We've only been to maybe two different places. Um, but I think um, the probably the best place I've been is in Ole Miss. Uh, they have a little section downtown. I can't remember the name of the restaurant. Ajax? But there. Ajax might be. I think that might be the place. Yeah, yeah. but we went to a, went to a place, really nice food. I mean, it was really good. Uh, obviously, anywhere with some good barbecue, we're all for LSU. Uh, had some good old Cajun food when we went there uh, with some good spices and kicks to them. So there, 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 are, there are a couple of different places that have different styles that you like. Um, but I'm a food guy. I, I, I'll probably eat anything right now. Uh, but I, I love going to these different restaurants. Outside of Athens, what is your favorite SEC East town? Oh, man. Favorite SEC East town? What's interesting enough is I never got a chance to go to Gainesville. Hmm. Um, but I think the number one town would have to be Nashville. I mean, Nashville is one of the top places you can be. They got good food, obviously good music. Uh, Nashville is one of the top towns, I think, that you can be a part of and go to uh, whenever you get a chance to go. So it's been fun. I've had a chance to do Bandy uh, three or four times uh, each year. And uh I love going there and, you know, eating there, which is also pretty cool. You're not the first person on the show to mention that. <laughs> Nashville's a good place to be, man. I've got a couple more questions for you. Uh, obviously, uh, back in your playing days, I believe if memory serves me correctly, you actually took a trip to Starkville and beat the Bulldogs. I've got to ask you, my co-host down there is a, is a Mississippi <laughs> State graduate and fan what are your thoughts about the cowbells and how difficult is it to play with them uh, being a player on the field? Bro, it's unbelievable. When I tell you, <laughs> I remember when we went there and Coach Rick said, look, it's going to be all right. They told them they can't bring the cowbells in. They'll be okay. They don't have to worry about all the ringing and rolling. We get there. It's a night game. We have, we're in warm-ups and we hear cowbells going crazy. This is and that's this is how bad it is. Yes, yes. This yeah, is they were still banned at was, that time. It was banned, but they had at least 10, 15,000. It was crazy. <laughs> this is how bad it is. I come to the line of scrimmage one time, and I'm trying to change the protection. I'm trying to change the protection to go left. My tight end is on the backside. Because of these cowbells going crazy, everybody hears me except for my backside tight end. We snap the ball. I'm looking to my left to throw. The whole offensive line goes left. My tight end goes right. Their biggest defensive end comes right down the line untouched and uncorks on me. And I'm talking about ball flying. I got a knot on my arm like three, four inches off my elbow. I was so glad that they had to replay the call just to see if it was a fumble because I was dazed for a minute. And wow. they had to make sure they get that knot down. But that's how loud it is. It was hard to hear. Uh... I get on to my boy Jerry's Norwood all the time about it. He's a bulldog. I tell him you guys are the second-rate bulldogs. Uh, so we always have a good time with that. I was about to bring that up. I wasn't going to bring this up until you started telling that story. I remember <laughs> when Jerry S. went to the Falcons, and you were also with the Falcons. Uh, yeah. They were doing some interview with uh, Falcons. I think Fred McRae uh, was with them. And you walked by saying something like, well, we're the real bulldogs. So they they yeah. went and flagged you down. They, all three of them went and flagged you down. I always had to mess with the Mississippi State guys, man. I mean, they, 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 they think best, you know. They, they have good intentions to say they're Bulldogs, but I think at the end of the day, everybody knew, you know, they were the, the second-rate Bulldogs. When you say the Bulldogs, nobody thinks Mississippi State. They always right. say Georgia Bulldogs. So I always like to mess with them boys about it. Well, you know, if you're definitely in the East, yeah, they always think that. But if you're in the West, you say the Bulldogs. Uh, Georgia hardly comes to mind because who's the set rival for Georgia in the West every year? Who's the set rival? Is It's Auburn. It's Auburn. Auburn yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, Auburn all day. I mean, so, some of my good buddies are Jason Campbell and uh, Ronnie mm -hmm. Brown, Carlos Rodgers, all those dudes who 
uh, I played against. And uh, Auburn is absolutely the biggest rival we have over there in the West. And it's been like that for I don't know how long. Yeah, the, the, the oldest game in the South, which is one of my favorite games every single year. What's your favorite game from the oldest game, uh, the oldest rivalry in the South? Oh, man. Oh, uh, uh, man. I, you know, favorite game, you said from Georgia Auburn? Yeah. Uh, there's, man, there's a couple games that, 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 that probably come to mind, I think. Um, we had a chance to go down there. I don't remember what year it was, but we ended up beating them with a late field, a couple of late field goals. But um, I think the biggest, the best one has to be when uh, my boys got got crushed when they went to Auburn, but then in the SC Championship game, they ended up coming back and whooping them pretty good. Uh, so I, I like that game, Georgia and Auburn, when they beat them in the SC Championship game. Yes. I got you. Well, my final question for you is this. Obviously, your broadcast partner, Dave Neal, uh, has also switched over to doing some basketball. Is there any chance that we could see you calling some basketball games this year? <laughs> I, I doubt that, bro. Okay. I mean, the, basketball, the basketball dudes would be like, what is this football dude coming over here talking basketball for? So uh, I think they got enough basketball dudes okay. to, to call games. Dave? Uh, with the play-by-play -play can, uh, can seamlessly go from football to basketball to baseball. But uh, they kind of keep it pretty uh, sport-specific for us analysts. I gotcha. Hey, uh, when we're talking about other sports, I can't help but notice over your head, I see a flag from from Augusta, if, if I'm mean, not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, yeah, a, I'm a huge, huge, huge golf fan, man. Love to play golf. Uh, of course, you know, Augusta's in my backyard here in Georgia, so I mm -hmm. uh, love to go down there um, and play. I was at uh, East Lake this past year uh, watching Dustin go out and crush the course. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a big golf fan, man. I love golf. I think I just saw Tiger and his son today being uh, simultaneously having the same swing and mannerism as they swing. Like, uh, I'm all about some golf. I love playing. Tell us about your first trip to Athens. I mean, to excuse me, to Augusta. Oh man, uh, I wanted to sleep there. I mean, <laughs> watching it, watching it on TV doesn't no justice. I mean, you're watching it on TV like, oh man, that looks really nice. That looks really pretty and beautiful. But to get there and you're like, I could literally lay on this thing and go to sleep. There is not a wow. piece of grass out of place. There is not a piece of. Uh, uh, nobody is littered anywhere, no piece of trash anywhere. I mean, I'm literally looking for something out of place, and there was nothing. So it is truly immaculate. It is one of the finest golf courses you would ever see, and uh, it is absolutely nice. Now, I'm not going down this route, so don't panic when I ask this question. We know Tommy Tuberville sent to the Senate, but if Coach Mark Rick ever decided to run for office, would you be right there beside him? No. <laughs> <laughs> No way. I, I would wish him well and uh, give him all my support, but uh, which is crazy because people have always asked me, did I want to get into politics? I'm like, for what? Why do I look like I want to be in politics? I want no parts of it. But uh, if Coach Rick does, I give him a big thumbs up. Go get him, Coach. But uh, I would not be the guy that be his running mate or trying to be a part of it at all. <laughs> Very interesting. DJ, This the pleasure was all ours. Hey, before we head out, I hope Stephen didn't ask this when I had some computer difficulties. We just had signing day. Did Stephen ask you about the craziest recruiting story you've ever heard? You can uh, feel free to leave the school and, and the uh, individual in or out, but what's the craziest recruiting story you've ever heard? Uh... The craziest one is, I've had one that's happened to me when I was coming out. Uh, you know how the kids have all the different, um, you know, different poses and they have all these different, you know, things they put on Twitter and all this kind of stuff. Well, I won't mention the school, but it was kind of like when I, when I walked into the stadium, uh, you know how some places they'll have your name on the big board or they have your name going around the, the stadium and the, you know, the, the LED lights or whatever. Well, this particular school literally painted my name in the end zone. And wow. I thought this was beyond, beyond crazy that they took the time to even write my name in the end zone and uh, made it seem like, hey, this is your home. 
So we wanted your name to be here. Come here and play. So uh, that was the craziest thing I had ever seen in recruiting uh, for myself, at least uh, throughout that time. Wow. I do have one final question for you, DJ. Are you and Dave calling a game this weekend? And if so, can you break it down for us? No, see, we, we were we were on the Georgia okay. uh, Vanderbilt game, which ended up getting canceled. Uh, but we do have a bowl game coming up uh, on the 22nd, actually, which is a right. really good bowl game in Boca. Uh, we got UCF going against BYU. So that should be a really good ball game, top 25 teams. Two quarterbacks that are uh, got 30 touchdowns apiece, four to seven, mm-hmm. three to seven between them. Uh, Dylan Gabriel and uh, everybody knows Zach Wilson are out BYU. So it's going to be a fun game to call, man. I'm looking forward to being on that one. And we know what BYU uh, has done this season, taking on that game versus Postal, you know, in two days yes. notice. So uh, I'm looking forward to that game and seeing some dudes sling it and throw it around. Yeah. Well, man, DJ, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today. Uh, and is there anything that you would like to give a shout out to, tell people how they can find you, that kind of stuff? Well, I appreciate you guys having me, man. I know uh, a lot going on these days, but I appreciate you guys having me on. And uh, People can find me at DJ Shockley 3 or DJ Shock 3 on uh, Instagram and Twitter. Um, I do a podcast every week. It's called the Triple Threat Podcast. I had some of my old, a bunch of my friends who uh, played against. Uh, we've had guys like Danny Warfel on there, Maurice Claret. Uh, we had a bunch of, you know, Jeff Francoeur. We've had a bunch of different guys on the podcast. Comes out every uh, week. So you can follow that at, at Triple Threat Podcast. So I appreciate Absolutely. you guys allowing me to do that. Yes, sir. And uh, be to check it out. So uh, appreciate you guys, man. Happy holidays to you. Yes. And uh, you guys stay safe, man. Thank hey, you, man. DJ. Make sure you get some Red Bull for that bowl game with those quarterbacks throwing 30 touchdown passes. That's going to be a four-and-a-half-hour game, brother. I know, man. They're going to sling it around, man. So I'm, I'm excited. as a QB. That's what I like, so I'm all for it. There you go. <laughs> all right, man. Well, thank you so much. And uh, if we don't talk to you, Merry Christmas. Thank you, guys. Appreciate all right. it. All right. Well, man, that was a really good interview there, and we want to thank DJ for coming on. And uh, hopefully in the offseason, we can bring him back on and talk about more in depth his playing days uh, there at the University of Georgia. And then maybe go on on into the NFL in his playing days up there in Atlanta. Yeah, you know, DJ was a phenomenal talent. Uh, yes. He was he was so good. And it's so hard that, uh, you know, it's hard to believe that Georgia probably had uh, easily – two of their top five quarterbacks of all time uh, there at the same time with DJ and David Green. And that was just a tough break for DJ, but he shined very bright uh, his senior year. And and again, he was an NFL talent after starting just one year at Georgia. So uh, huge props to DJ is sticking it out. I know he talked about that and I was impressed with that, but I have nothing but respect for DJ Shockley and the man that he is. And Heath, real quick, let me throw this nugget at you before we get out of here. Uh, the last three games of DJ's career at Georgia were played in the city of Atlanta. He played uh, Georgia Tech, then the SEC championship mm-hmm. game, and then mm-hmm. the Sugar Bowl was actually oh, moved. Oh, that's right, because Katrina. To Hurricane Katrina. That's right. I forgot about that. Yeah, it sure so, was. Last three games of his career in Atlanta. And we are back live. We want to thank DJ Shockley for joining us. And uh, that was a great interview. And hopefully we can have him back on the show here pretty soon. Yeah, DJ, you know, it, I didn't know he was such a big golf fan, Stephen. That's kind of yeah. impressive. Uh, I'd say I would love to go play 18 holes with DJ and pick his brain about football, life, uh, recruiting, the SEC, television, you name it. But. Uh, massive props for uh, DJ coming on. You know, we told Dory uh, that we're not a breaking news show, uh, but we actually did have some breaking news. I don't know if you saw it while we were doing the interview. Auburn has narrowed the search down and actually put this guy as their number one target now. And this ought to sting a little bit if you're an Alabama fan. 
Alabama's offensive coordinator, Steve Sarkeesian, is supposed to interview with Auburn now on Sunday. Not a shocker. Um, <laughs> Steven, how did Sark look during the Iron Bowl when he filled in for Nick Saban? Outstanding. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think me and you could have filled in and, and won that game. Why aren't we being considered? Yes. Um, <laughs> so so um, that is – he is now the number one uh, prospect – uh, for the head coach, as he will be uh, interviewing for that job on Sunday. So uh, that's going to make things really interesting uh, for the SEC championship game tomorrow. Could that right there be a distraction for the Crimson Tide? I don't think so. Um, you know, I think Sark uh, will handle it very professionally. You know, Dan Mullen uh, interviewed for the Mississippi State job um, right after the SEC championship game when he was at Florida to come to Mississippi State. So uh, this is a normal practice. Uh, I got a feeling uh, Saban assistants on his staff over many years uh, have interviews directly after the game or the next day. Right. So with that being said, I think this is just another walk in the park. Uh, look what Sark did at Washington. Look what he did at USC. He's very, very proven. Uh, he is a winner. He didn't lose his job at USC because of losses. Right. It was, it was a personal issue. He's on top of that. I know there's a lot of question marks uh, that some people are like, ah, I don't know if we want to turn the program over. Uh, he's got a proven track record that he's back. Yes. And if Nick Saban says that he's clean, he's clean. You know, yep. uh, Sark finished number two to um, Mike Leach and Starkville uh, this past year. So, uh, you know, what would that say if Sark goes into Auburn, starts dominating, and even uh, gets into the playoff one year yes. or wins the West? So uh, I think Sark is a phenomenal coach. I think he's a wonderful play caller. Uh, I don't keep up with recruiting, so I don't know, but I got a feeling that he's a strong recruiter or he wouldn't be in the position that he's in now. Yes. Well, man, uh, since you are up there close to this school, I want your take on this, and then I will give you mine. What are your thoughts about Kenny, Kenny, yeah, how do you say that last name? <laughs> Yeboa. Yeboa. Okay, Kenny Yeboa and Elijah Moore both opting out before they play the rival LSU tomorrow to get ready for the NFL draft. What are your thoughts on that? I see both sides of the story. I understand that this game doesn't amount to anything tomorrow. Uh, they, you know, Ole Miss wants to claim that the rivalry with LSU is strong or it's even stronger than the Egg Bowl rivalry with Mississippi State. Uh, it's clearly not true. Uh, right. If this was a big rivalry, you would want to play in this game. Um, with that being said, um, again, I'll take it from both sides. The players – this game didn't mean anything. Uh, it's not going to help or hurt our bowl chances. Uh, we're just going to skip out, get ready for the NFL draft. On the other side of it, you've come this far. If you want to skip out in the bowl game, I'll give you that. But what's what's one more game? You yes. know, yeah, I understand you could get hurt, uh, but you can get hurt in any game. You can get hurt walking to your car. Uh, you know, so I mean, there's a million different things. But I see both sides. I understand that you want to prepare for the NFL draft. You want to start working out. You want to start uh, getting your body ready for that. Uh, that is a very tedious process. If you do not know, you just don't go up and show up and, and say, hey, run here and see how fast you can go. Yes. Uh, run these cones. I mean, that's not what that is. Uh, so uh, with that, I'm a little – perturbed that uh, yeah. any player I'm, I'm perturbed with players opt out of the bowl game uh, you, you know you don't get it you don't get to play football forever you play for yeah. a very short time and bowl games are special uh, it doesn't matter if you're playing in the Liberty Bowl if you're playing in the Outback Bowl if you're playing in the college football playoff they're special uh, yes. uh, football games are special especially at a high level when you get rewarded for your hard work during the season and so, uh, yeah, I have issue when guys uh, do it. But, again, I also understand, but I don't like it. What's your take, Stephen? I think it's real selfish of both of them because as a, as a uh, recruiter uh, and as a, you know, as a player, you're supposed to feel obligated to go on ahead and help your team win a rivalry game. 
Uh, and, and I really don't like the fact that uh, that they didn't do that. Yeah. You know, we saw with Terrence Marshall before the Alabama game, and I was just like, man, this is the best game to put stuff on tape to yes. show your highlight reel and, and for you to opt out. So I don't know. Um, here's the sad thing, Stephen. NFL teams don't care, and they kind of encourage them to sit out. Right. And, and it's just terrible, you know. There's going to be a day, well, we saw it a couple of years ago, but I remember Jadavian Clowney when he was at South Carolina. Yep. He thought about sitting out his entire senior season because he knew he was going to be the number one overall pick. He's like, why should I risk getting hurt? And, you know, and, and I was like, I hope we're not getting to that. But there was a receiver, I think, at University of Houston uh, uh, just a couple of years ago who uh, was a great NFL talent, and he was opting out. He was dressing, but he wasn't playing. That, that was so much drama on that. Yeah. And I'm just like, you know, I would kind of respect the Jadavian Clowney approach of, which he did not do, of just sitting out the entire senior year than rather than play part of the year or skip out on a bowl game or skip out on a couple of games saying, well, I just got to get ready for the draft now. I, I don't get it. Well, let's go ahead and start championship week picks. Are you ready for that? Absolutely. All right. Well, we're going to start tonight at 6 p.m. on the CBS Sports Network. We actually have UAB 5-3 and three, traveling up to Marshall. Now, Marshall has not played since they got beat uh, and shut out by the Marshall Thundering, I mean, by the Rice Owls. Uh, UAB at Marshall, uh, 6 p.m. CBS Sports Network. Marshall is a four-and-a-half-point favorite. And the Football Power Index gives Marshall a 68% chance to win this game. Marshall on paper looks great, but the game's not played on paper, Stephen. Right. Billy Clark and the Blazers. I know it sounds like a band. I've said that before on the show, but Billy Clark and the Blazers, I like them a lot. I still do not know why Auburn or any SEC school has not reached out to Billy Clark. Um, I think he would be a home run hire. Yes. At Auburn, but uh, since he's not, he's had extra time to focus. I like Billy Clark and the Blazers. I'm actually going a little different. I'm going Marshall. I think they back, bounce back in that matchup. All right, next up is going to be, and you know, Heath, we've talked about all of the conferences in college football except this one this year. This is actually the first time we have actually talked about the MAC. And the MAC championship tonight is at 6:30 on ESPN. It is between Ball State five and one versus Buffalo six and zero. Oh. You know, uh, get a little MAC shit for you. I love yes. the MAC games on Wednesday. You know, you get home from church on Wednesday night, turn on a little MAC shit. Yes. But uh, you know what? Uh, I was a huge fan of David Letterman growing up, even back on the old show on NBC and. All of his years with CBS, and I've even watched a show on Netflix. Uh, he is a proud Ball State alum. So I'm going with the Cardinal. I'm going with Ball State in this one. I'm actually going with the Buffalo, uh, the Bulls of Buffalo. I think that they get done. I think that they end the season, regular season, I should say, undefeated. And I think they get a pretty good bowl bid. I'm going with Buffalo. I'm, I'm going with the Vegas and the FPI uh, team there. All right. Yeah, Dave what Letterman uh, dedicated a building on the campus to at Ball State, and it's dedicated to all C students. That's awesome, man. <laughs> He's a weatherman. Uh, I, I figured you'd be a fan. Uh, yeah, I guess. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Let, let's stay on track now. Uh, next up is going to be uh, a snoozer of a game, uh, but I just wanted to pick this game because it was uh, one of the games for tonight. It is going to be Nebraska 2-5 and five at Rutgers 3-5, and five, 6.30 on the Big Ten Network. Nebraska is a 6.5-point favorite. And the Football Power Index likes Nebraska, too. I'm actually going with the Rutgers Scarlet Knights winning this game at home. Wow. You know, we didn't go over this in pre-production, but uh, I'm going to go with Dari just because he covered Nebraska. I talked to them earlier on the show. We talked about how great their fans are. I'm going with the Cornhuskers, man. I'm going with Nebraska. I got you. We've been All opposite right. every pick. 
Well, here's the deal. Uh, earlier this week, and you and I actually talked about it via text, uh, the Washington Huskies uh, came down with a lot of COVID in their, uh, in their facilities. So they had to forego uh, the Pac-12 championships. So guess what the Pac-12 did? They slid Oregon into Washington's spot. So now it is going to be three and two Oregon taking on USC in the Pac-12 championship game. Uh, this game is actually a primetime game at 7 o'clock on Fox. USC is only a three-point favorite, and USC is only favored to win by 57%. Man, I want to go Oregon here, but after that bad loss to California, I'm going, tro I'm going with the Trojans all the way. Wow, Steven, uh, we're on polar opposites today. I like Oregon uh, just because, um, I don't know, this has been a crazy uh, year, crazy season, and uh, I think that uh, college football fans might want to see USC knocked out of this. I think there's a lot of goodwill with the Oregon Ducks, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with uh, Oregon there, quack, quack. And uh, so you're actually going with old Joe Moorhead, huh? Yeah, Joe Mo. Uh, and by the way, uh, what have you, what have you, what are your thoughts on his tenure this year up at the, there being the um, offensive coordinator at Oregon? Well, it's first year they didn't have a spring practice. Uh, you know, um, his system is very complicated. Yes, um, but I think with Joe. I think Joe will be a head coach again. I think he'll be a very successful head coach at a very high level. Uh, I think he made all of his mistakes at Mississippi State, and so be it. That, that issue is over. That boat is sailed. Yes. But I, I, I like Joe. I think that offense needed some needed some extra work. It needed some help. It needed a spring. So, um, But it's coming around, uh, just like a lot of offenses that have struggled this year with new coaches and New OCs, you know, it's just one of those things. I would be really shocked if we differ on this pick. Let's go to Saturday, 11 a.m. on Fox. It is uh, Ohio State taking on uh, Northwestern. Uh, both teams are, are highly ranked. Ohio State is fourth. Northwestern is 14th. However, uh, the Football Power Index gives Ohio State a 90% chance to win this game, and the Vegas likes Ohio State by 20. I, I'm just going to go ahead and make this short, sweet, and to the point Buckeyes roll. I agree with you with the Buckeyes almost every week, but the Buckeyes lay eggs every year, sooner or later. They haven't laid one yet, but they are due to lay an egg, Stephen. Shockingly, I'm going against you. I am going with Northwestern only because I don't think Northwestern's a better team. I yes. just think Ohio State's going to lay an egg. Okay, so you're going with uh, Pat Fitzgerald, huh? Yes, I am. So, uh, and that game, like I said, will be 11 a.m. on Fox. All right, next up is going to be uh, a the first of a lot of SEC games uh, to lead up to uh, the SEC championship game. Uh, this game is going to be 11 a.m. on ESPN, and uh, it could seal, you know, it could seal the fate of Jeremy Pruitt at at uh, Tennessee if they do not perform well against this football team. It is number five Texas A&M, seven and one at three and five Tennessee. What are your thoughts on this game, Heath? Uh, because I really feel like that uh, if Tennessee gets blown out horribly and miserably, uh, I think Philip Fulmer might actually make a coaching change. I think if Tennessee doesn't win the coin toss, Stephen, they're not going to win anything the rest of the day. Yes. I think A&M is going to roll. They're going to roll big. They're going to roll at the beginning, the middle, and the end, and it's not going to stop. A&M needs some style points. Yes. To uh, help themselves. So if A&M has a chance to blow this thing wide open, you better believe it, that they yes. will take the volunteers behind the woodshed and just lay it to them. So you're going with gig them? I'm gigging them all the way, brother. I'm going gigging them too. All right, next up is going to be 
uh, and everybody's kind of written off uh, this conference because of the uh, four, you know, the, the two losses of, of a lot of teams. There's no Texas. Uh, but this is going to be for the Big 12 championship. It is going to be number 10, Oklahoma, 7-2, and two, versus number 6, Iowa State, 8-2. and two. Now, if you will remember, Iowa State beat Oklahoma earlier in the year. Uh, I think it was week number two for the Big 12. Uh, this game is at 11 a.m. on ABC. Oklahoma is a five-point favorite, and the Football Power Index gives Oklahoma a 67% chance to win. However, do however, uh, Heath, is there any chance that Iowa State knocks them off two times in a row in one season? Yeah, I think there's a case. I mean, is it the mongoose to their snake? I mean, uh, that's a good possibility. Football is not about rankings. Football is not always about talent. Sometimes it is. Right. But football is about matchups. And when teams don't match up good with other teams, I mean, it, it ruins things. Yes. Iowa State is a problem for Oklahoma. It is. That's why Iowa State beat Oklahoma. So it's not a good matchup for the Sooners, but – I do think that uh, Oklahoma is going to correct some of those mistakes from the first time. Oklahoma's playing good football. So, hey, Boomer Sooner. Yep, I, I like Boomer Sooner as well in that one, but do not be surprised that this game comes down to a final possession. All right, next up, and we actually have some disappointing news. Uh, this actually broke last night about 8 o'clock. This game right here will not be played due to COVID at Coastal Carolina. Uh, so the uh, Sun Belt is trying, trying their hardest to make this game an actual bowl game uh, for both teams. And then at that point, they would award uh, the winner the Sun Belt Championship game. Uh, so that, of course, is something to keep your eye on for this bowl season which actually does start Monday. Uh, but like I said, this game right here will not be played tomorrow due to COVID at Coastal Carolina. And that sucks because this game was played earlier in the year, and that was the only blemish of the record of Louisiana as Coastal Carolina knocked them off 30-27. to 27. Steven, I, I like how you're pointing. Let me get, yes. there, there, there we go. Yeah, yeah. There it is. Hey, uh, you forgot the uh, the ranking there. I know. I, I know. Yeah, yeah num I, I, number nine, Coastal Carolina, the Shanty Yes. Bears. Yes. Um, yeah, I like. I I would like for this game to be played. Yeah. Uh, I think we all do. Hey, if you can play this, uh, uh, you know, after the ball games, uh, whatever, I would be all up for this game. I think yeah. everybody wants to see this game. That's the beautiful thing about twenty twenty is that. We saw some games get canceled for the bigger conferences and some uh, bigger conferences getting such a late start that we saw some of these smaller conferences play. And a lot of people know about Louisiana and Coastal Carolina now. I think it's been wonderful for those programs. And yeah. this would have been a game that a lot of people would have watched. I know I would have. Yes. Well, man, let's go to another game that is actually going to be played uh, and this one is actually going to be what I call a, a sneaky good little matchup here. Uh, it is going to be 3-2 and two Air Force at 8-2 and two Army, 2 o'clock CBS Sports Network. Tomorrow, Air Force is a 2.5-point favorite, but the Football Power Index likes Army, the Black Knights in this one. I'm actually going with the Black Knights just because they've played more games than Air Force has. Wow. Nice call. You know what, Stephen? I'm going opposite. I'm going with the Falcons. I am going with the Air Force Academy in this one. And, and, I, and I've argued this several times before. I've always thought Air Force had some of the coolest uniforms in college football. Yes. I, don't like, I don't like the blue helmets as much. I do like the white helmets with, with the blue bolt. But uh, with that... Air Force is a good team. They haven't had a chance to play that many games this year. But Air Force is an incredibly good team. And I don't think this is a good matchup for Army. And I think Army's coming off uh, a little bit of emotion from last weekend in that game. So 
I'm going with the Falcons. I got you. And uh, by the way, this game right here, uh, from now on, uh, starting next year, will actually be pl- actually be played in Dallas. Uh, so that's rather interesting. That's uh, pretty much you know a, a neutral site for both teams because you know Air Force would be coming from Colorado. All right, man, next up is going to be uh, the rivalry game uh, that we talked about with Elijah Moore. Uh, it is going to be four and four, Ole Miss going down to the Bayou to take on four and five LSU, 230 on the SEC network. Uh, Ole Miss is a two and a half point favorite, but the football power index actually likes LSU in this matchup. I'm actually going with the Tigers of LSU because I feel like uh, with the absence of Elijah Moore and the tight end, uh, that's going to really hurt that Ole Miss offense. Yeah, I think that um, I think that's going to hurt a lot. Uh, coming into this week, I was going to pick Ole Miss. Even last night, I was leaning toward Ole Miss. Uh, but this is not a good matchup uh, for uh, the Rebels. This is actually a great matchup for LSU because LSU has got some, they've got some, you know, thoroughbreds in the backfield. They're yeah. going to hand that ball off and they're going to make some noise. And so also LSU with Johnson at quarterback now, Steven, I think he is the future in the face of the program for LSU. So look for LSU to get a little fancy with the pass. LSU coming off that big win from last week. Will that confuse the young team? I think it will. But I do like the chances of LSU only because that Ole Miss defense is is not good. And that's not a good matchup. So I really think that LSU will run the ball at ease and make things happen. And also, uh, you'll see uh, the passing game kind of pick up pace a little bit more this week uh, as they take on the Rebels. So I definitely like LSU and I like LSU big. Dude, I'm sorry about that. I had to leave just for a brief second because uh, – here where I live, we have an alarm system. Yeah, and, I heard it. And uh, it was going off, and I didn't actually want it to start doing. Rawr, 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 rawr. Uh, so I had to go and uh, and put the code in on the uh, actual key box. Hey, tell everybody what's the, what's the code? No, no, definitely not. No, hey. no. <laughs> how, how does that alarm go? Rawr. Like that. That's exactly yeah. how it goes. Yeah. So uh, I will take LSU in that one. Uh, and who did you pick, Heath? I went LSU, brother. I got you. All right. Next up is going to be uh, a what I'm calling a blowout. Uh, and unfortunately, I, I feel like that this game is not even going to be close. Uh, it is going to be 2.30 on the SEC alternate channel. Uh, Missouri is a one-point favorite. And the football power index only likes Missouri with a 55% chance to win this game. However, I uh, was really discouraged by Mississippi State last weekend. Uh, I think their offense kind of regressed a little bit. I'm actually going with M-I-Z coming to Starkville and uh, dropping Mississippi State to 2-8 and eight on the year. Wow. Wow. You know, uh, their freshman quarterback, uh, you know, I was a little shocked when I saw he's only got five touchdown passes this year. Yes. Uh, I was a little shocked by that. Um, You know, Mississippi State does really good against the run, extremely good against the run. Um, You know, they suffer against the pass. That will be Mizzou's big ticket to punch their ticket to a victory tomorrow on this one. But you know what? I know we got a lot of Missouri friends and family on this show. Uh, I like them all. It's not going to happen, Stephen. It's not going to happen, Stephen. I like the dogs. The dogs will run in the rain, brother. It's going to be raining at Starkville. I like the dogs. I like the dogs big. Really? Big. Are you going? No. I, I will be there. I will be there. Man, that's going to be a blast. Hey, Stephen. I really don't like the dogs big, but I'm going to say that, though. I got you. All right. Well, uh, let's keep on going, and let's talk about another uh, squeaky good game. Uh, And I actually think that this team is actually going to have a little bit of a distraction uh, because uh, their defensive coordinator 
was actually named uh, the Vanderbilt coach earlier in the week. It is going to be the rematch between uh, Trevor Lawrence and the Clemson Tigers versus Notre Dame uh, there in the ACC championship game at 3 p.m. ABC. Clemson is a 10-point favorite, and the Football Power Index gives Clemson a 71 percent chance to win this game not so fast my friend i'm going notre dame wins this game again whoa wow look at you steven hey when we were airing the interview i was reading about Brian kelly and the irish and they said they would boycott the playoff yes uh, uh, if they if they couldn't let family come with them um i thought it was pretty bold of Brian kelly to say that I want Notre Dame to win. I will be kind of pulling for Notre Dame. But if I got to pick a winner, I'm picking Clemson. But I will be pulling for the Irish tomorrow. Yes. Uh, and the reason, you know, I just I feel like that when you watch that game up in um, uh, when they were playing up in uh, Notre Dame earlier this year, neither defense could stop the other one. Like right here, you can see this guy, uh, second play of the game, actually went for a huge uh, touchdown there, and it kind of set the tone of, okay, whoever has the ball last wins. Uh, and, and I feel like it's going to be that same way tomorrow, but I, I still like Ian Book. I think he's the better quarterback in this matchup. Yeah, too bad we can't have Timmy B on the show today and singing the fight song on Notre Dame. Yeah, that was a blast. <laughs> All right, next up is going to be uh, – ooh, sorry, man. I hit the wrong button. I, t I pulled you down for a second. My bad. All right, next up is going to be the Mountain West Championship game. Uh, and this is actually going to be uh, hosted somewhere other than at the Blue Field in Boise. This one, is actually, yep, this one is actually going to be uh, played in Las Vegas. Uh, because San Jose State is the home team. It is going to be 3-15 tomorrow on Fox, and uh, our friend Tim Brando will be on the call for this game. Boise State is a six-and-a-half point favorite, and the Football Power Index likes Boise State, giving them a 68% chance to win this game. I've been on San Jose State all year long. I'm going to continue. I'm going with San Jose State. The Spartans beat Boise in Vegas. Wow. Look at that. I um, I like Boise State. I like Boise State a lot. But you know what? I got to roll with San Jose State, man. I got to. And too bad we couldn't get Ray, good friends of the show, we'll get Ray together from UNLV since they're out in Las Vegas and Timmy B together. Ray and Timmy B, that's Man, that's a night on the town. I'll be a night Vegas yes. won't forget. And by the way, speaking of Ray, and uh, give me just a second. Hey, I'm giving you a second. Ray, I told Stephen before the show in pre-production that I forgot my shirts and my cap. Thank you, brother. I got them. And, and God bless you. I forgot them, but I will be wearing them on the show next week. Hey, and by the way, uh, I'm pulling up full screen. Or are you – yeah, let me take that down. Uh, by the way, we're doing a little segment real quick on this team right here uh, because it was announced earlier that UNLV in 2023 has just signed a, uh, a uh, an extension uh, that they will actually play Michigan in 2023. They're going back to the big house. Wow. So uh, oh. UNLV will be playing Michigan again in the big house in 2023. So I had to throw that nugget out there. And that was actually uh, from Brent McMurphy uh, during the DJ Shockley interview. He actually uh, made that announcement on Twitter. And so with, uh, you know, Ray being a UNLV fan, I had to go ahead and uh, bring that news up. Yeah. You know, um, UNLV, if you haven't seen the 30 for 30, I'm staying on UNLV, but jumping sports. If you haven't seen the yeah. 30 for 30 on UNLV, uh, phenomenal, phenomenal. Yes. Go watch that. Uh, that was part of my childhood. Uh, uh, late junior high, early high school, uh, those were some great teams from UNLV, fun times. But, yeah, uh, if you haven't seen that, 
spend some time during the holiday season and watch that. You will be yes. heavily entertained. Yes. All right, man. Well, next up is going to be a, a, a snoozer game, uh, kind of like the Nebraska and Rutgers game. But the reason I actually chose this game uh, was because I actually read an article uh, where the uh, you know the tenure of Chip Kelly there at UCLA it is not a foregone conclusion uh, that he will return next year. Uh, so this game right here uh, could determine if, in fact, UCLA continues to stay with Chip Kelly. Uh, it is going to be 6 p.m. tomorrow on ESPN, Stanford at UCLA. And if they get beat, do not be surprised if you see Chip Kelly's name being uh, fired or let go on Sunday. I don't think that's the case. I'm actually going with UCLA beating Stanford tomorrow just simply because they're playing at the Rose Bowl, and I think they actually pick up the win being at home. Fair enough. You know, Chip Kelly was on top of the world, college football world, a couple of years ago. And uh, I, I, I just made this up off the top of my head. It all crashed when he went and let Tim Tebow on his Eagles team in Philadelphia. And ever yes. since then, he's been going downhill ever since. The curse of Tim Tebow is on Chip Kelly now. Yes. Totally made that up. Uh, hashtag curse of Tim Tebow, right? Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I'm going to pull for UCLA in this one. Uh, this is a snoozer game. No one cares. No one absolutely cares. Uh, people in Los Angeles don't care about this game. Right. Uh, people in Oakland, and excuse me, people in Berkeley don't care about this game. So, uh, 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 no, excuse me, it's uh, Palo Alto. Palo, yeah, yeah. yeah. No one in Palo Alto care. Folks in Palo Alto probably don't even know they have a football team. So Yes. Uh, yeah, with this, uh, who cares about this game? So I'll, I'll pull for the champagne and sky blue of the Bruins of UCLA out of Westwood. But, uh, yeah, no one cares. Yeah. All right. And, by the way, there is one more. Uh, now, I didn't do a highlight, and I did not do a banner, but there is one more Pac-12 game tomorrow night. It is going to be 930 on ESPN Arizona State at Oregon State. Uh, so that is the only late night game that we have tomorrow night. But there are two other ones and bigger matchups that come on before that one. And before uh, we get to what I'm calling the game of the week, uh, we will talk about uh, the game that we talked to Dory, Dory Noka about. It is going to be 7 p.m. on ABC. It is the AAC Championship. It is number 23, Tulsa, 8-1, versus number 9, Cincinnati, at 8-0. Cincinnati is a 14.5-point favorite, and the Football Power Index gives Cincinnati an 80% chance to win this game. Guess what, Heath? I'm going with the Golden Hurricanes spoiling the awesome season for Cincinnati Give me the Golden Hurricanes. They find a way to get it done. Stephen, we finally agree. I am going with Tulsa. Uh, I think that it's going to be uh, a little bit of a crazy game, and I think for some reason the Golden Hurricane will pull it out midway through the fourth quarter and make this a difficult obstacle for Cincinnati to overcome. I like Tulsa, baby. So, man, that's going to be awesome. Uh, and let's just go ahead and let the uh, highlights run out here. So, uh, we both go with Tulsa in that game. Uh, but I, I really feel like that, that could be a high-scoring affair uh, tomorrow night there on ABC. All right, let's get to the game of the weekend, uh, obviously because it is in Atlanta, and it is here based off of the SEC where we are. It is number seven, Florida, versus number one, Alabama. Alabama is a 17-point favorite. Alabama is favored by an 85, 89% chance to win this game. Uh, man, I got to tell you what. Uh, you know, last week I was really, really, uh, you know, leaning towards Florida. But after they got beat horribly by LSU, uh, and that was a stupid call uh, by him, that guy throwing the shoe. Uh, Dan Mullen has thrown fuel to the fire this week, saying that they are going to beat Alabama Saturday night. Uh, Dan Mullen has had one win 
against uh, Nick Saban in Alabama, and that was when Coach Mullen was an offensive coordinator at Florida when mm-hmm. Urban Meyer was the coach. Guess what? If you're ever going to see Dan Mullen beat Alabama, I'm going to have to actually see it to believe it. I'm going roll tide and roll tide big in this game tomorrow night. Dan Mullen's the second best coach in the SEC. Florida is the second best team in the SEC. Yep. Sadly, they got to play the first place team with the best coach. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's should I dare say it, Stephen. If Florida doesn't win the coin toss, they're not going to win anything the rest of the day. I like the Tide. I like the Tide. Uh, making this game ugly. Uh, Bama doesn't need to win by style points. Right. But, you know, uh, some people said Bama could lose a close one and uh, still get in the playoff. Probably so. Yes. But it's not going to be close. They're not going to lose. This no. one's going to get ugly. And so uh, I here's what to watch for. Watch to see if that defense for Florida quits in the second half. Yeah. See if it starts falling and quitting. And here's the craziest thing I've heard is that Todd Grantham's job is on the line. I don't know why. Uh, you know, Todd Grantham's job should not be on the line. But if, if Florida fires him, he will end up in the SEC again, and he will make someone's life miserable. Uh, I was just reading over some of the comments here, and uh, that is all the games that we have. But, Heath, what about that? I saw that earlier, man. I, uh, I've heard about Shakespeare's Pizza in, in, in Columbia, in, there in Como. Uh, I'd love to try some. So, Stephen, uh, you bet all your money, and I'll eat all your pizza. How, how's that? Uh, no, man, because actually you're you're in Starkville, man. So uh, go on ahead and uh, if you want to take that bet, go ahead. Oh, can, can I can I sell some uh, uh, Tostinos? Is that is that fair trade? Yes, I think so. Who doesn't love dollar fifty pizza? I know those are so awesome. All right, man. Well, that's going to do it for this edition of the Stingray Show. We hope you guys have thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, we didn't go as long as normal because, you know, usually we go uh, here recently two hours and a half. Uh, so hopefully we have not done that. We have not bored you guys to death. Uh, but next week, with it being Christmas, uh, we're doing a Tuesday and Wednesday show. And then we'll not be back until the following Tuesday uh, to take a break for Christmas. Uh, but I would also like to say this, too. Uh, the Stingray show is not... I repeat, is not going away just because football season is winding down. Uh, we would like to also transition this show into a basketball show. And then if we get really uh, boring with no sports, we will bring former players back on like Jacob Hester, DJ Shockley, uh, you know, Derek Pegues, Trevon Reed, uh, John Bond. And we will just talk about their playing days and some of the greatest moments that they've had. Uh, So don't worry and don't fret about, oh, well, football season's winding down. The Stingray show's about to leave. No, we're going to stay here as long as you guys will watch. We will be here. Am I still going to be here? Yeah, you you, you should, yeah. (laughs) I'm messing with you, Stephen. Hey, I want to give a great shout-out to DJ Shockley coming on the show today. Yes. Uh, The former Georgia quarterback. He was also the MVP of the SEC championship game. A wonderful interview with him today. Thank you, DJ, for coming on. Also, to our first guest of the day, Dari Noka from the SEC Network. Dari had a wonderful uh, interview with us. Many great stories that Dari shared. And, uh, yes, Boomer Sooner and go Golden Hurricane for Dari. So until next time, we'll see you again here on the Stingray Show. The dogs and Stingray are coming for you! (laughs) This is Stephen Ray, a.k.a. Stingray, coming to you live from Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Good afternoon, Mr. Feinbaum. Stingray here, and I'm about to see poor with you like all the Auburn students do down at Auburn. Worst defense ever! So without further ado, here is the biggest. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
going for the field goal. The kick is up. It is away. It is no good. Chris Davis bringing it out of the end zone. Oh, he's got blockers. Chris Davis up the sideline. Here he goes. Here we go, guys. Dobbs back to pass. Launching the ball. Jennings, he's got it. Jennings, he's got it. Touchdown, Tennessee. They shot the dogs in Sanford Stadium. Are you kidding me? My God almighty. What an epic way for the Tennessee-Georgia rivalry to end.